and I'm so excited for this next speaker, Gloria Felt. She's been a personal hero of mine. And uh, when I finished 5050, um, she contacted me, which was very exciting. And she is running an amazing organization, Take the Lead. And you're going to hear Farai interview her, and she'll give you the official bio, impressive bio introduction. But I am just here to tell you that I can't wait to hear this discussion. So enjoy Gloria Felt. Here's Farai. Thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> Hey, Gloria, how are you? Hey, I'm good, Farai. How are you? Oh, fantastic. It's always so good to talk to you. And you, of course, have had a long history of empowering women. You were the president of Planned Parenthood for nearly a decade and the author of several books, including No Excuses. And now, you know, you're, you're with Take the Lead. So, so let's start off. What is Take the Lead? Take the Lead is a, a, a nonprofit organization, deliberately, because we want all women to have access to what we're doing. We prepare, develop, inspire, and propel women, all of those things, the whole package, to take their fair and equal share of leadership positions across every sector by 2025. So you can see that we're totally aligned with 5050 Day, and that's why I was so excited when I saw T Tiffany's film. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot is how there, there is, uh, there's sometimes women who get into a leadership position, but then no one is able to follow behind. And so how do you, how do you think about not just having the first, but the first who's not the only? What makes it possible for women to succeed women in power? Oh, that is such an important question, as for I am so glad you asked it because, you know, we, we, we are, and in fact, I get that question frequently because we've seen a woman first almost everything, but sometimes that's all there is, and that's not enough. That will not do it, that will not do it. So what happens is that very often the first woman in thinks she has to be like a man, because she's, after all, navigating a culture that she did not create. And what we do at Take the Lead in our training is we teach what we call sister courage. In fact, we made a hashtag for it, hashtag sister courage. And I find women really resonate to that idea once they start thinking about it because, you know, nobody gets where we are alone. We all stand on the shoulders of so many other people. And that's another thing I love about the 50-50 day film is that it does give us a sense of the long arm of history. We didn't get here by ourselves. Anybody who thinks that she got there by herself is just, she's, she's living in an alternate universe. So we literally teach sister courage and mentoring is a part of what we do. Uh, mentoring is really important. And we find that increasingly women want to both be a mentor and get a mentor. So uh, we've partnered with a company called Glassbreakers and, and, and you can sign up to be a peer mentor on our website, just click mentor and you can check it out, see if that's helpful to you. So the training, the mentoring, the role modeling, you know, what you do when you just ask that question, how many people are watching us right now? Yeah. They're hearing it and they're thinking about the importance of role modeling and helping other women. Yeah. So all of those things, we have to do all of those things, but explicitly. Absolutely. And, you know, let's just talk a little bit about your personal journey because you've had a fascinating one. Tell us who you were as a, as a teenager and a young woman and how you became the woman you are today. Well, it's, it, it's a longer story than we have time for, but I'll give you the quick Cliff Notes version here. I, um, I grew up in small rural Texas towns. In an, in an era and in locations where, frankly, it's still like this in much of the country, um, where, where girls are not given great ambitions. We weren't, we weren't given ambitions for a career. Our career was to be the support system for everybody else. And I really bought into that, uh, a little too precocious about it, uh, that you were marrying young, you had kids, had a bunch of kids, you took care of everybody else. Um, I became pregnant at 15. I married my high school sweetheart. Um, I, at that time, I always say, if you've seen the last picture show, you've seen a documentary of that part of my life and then if you've seen the Friday Night Lights series you've seen a documentary of the next 20 years of my life in Odessa Texas and uh, and and you know it was it was one of those things where after I had my third child I was 20 and I just woke up I realized all of a sudden oh my goodness I have these three people who I could not have I couldn't support them if I ever had to I had no employable skills so really what helped me more than anything else was first starting to college. And, um, and, 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 and I, I, I think it's important to understand that it doesn't matter where you're starting from. The important thing is just to start. 
because I only had access to a community college at that time and it really saved my life. It enabled me to get started and start learning. Um, and then I became involved in the civil rights movement. And that taught me you can make change. That taught me it doesn't matter where you're where you're starting from. You can you can change. You can change society. You can, and and then I realized, oh well, then women must have civil rights too. <laughs> and it was at that point that I decided I would spend the rest of my life doing what I could to make sure that women would have an equal opportunity. And so I, I started. Uh, actually, my first job was teaching Head Start. I was planning to be a high school social studies teacher. And, uh, and, and as luck would have it, I was offered my first position with Planned Parenthood in a small affiliate. And I took it thinking I would do it for three years because, you know, why not give it a try? And 30 years later, I retired as the national president. Yeah. So I feel I, you know, I was very honored to have an opportunity to make my life's passion into my life's work. And at that point, I was ready to, um, to have a calmer life. But the last book that I wrote, which you mentioned, No Excuses, led me to ultimately co-found Take the Lead. So it's not calm anymore. Yeah. Now, 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 now there's a big mission again. I, I have to get women to leadership parity while I'm alive to see it. That's why we have to do it by 2025. Yeah. No, I mean, it, and it's, it's really extraordinary how you have been able to follow your passions and also like affect structural change. I think that that is something that's so important. And I just want to return to Planned Parenthood for a second because Planned Parenthood obviously gets uh, very politicized, but most of the work that Planned Parenthood does is, is about, you know, women's health across the board, just people going to get, you know, their checkups, GYN, et cetera. Um, you know, how do we how do we make sense? Healthcare has been such a big fight. How do we make sense of, of the things that women care about that may not um, just be gendered in a, a more traditional way, but just things like access to health care, access to jobs, access to education. How do we help women reach those goals that really help us build strong lives? Well, I'm glad you, you put all of those things together because I think the first answer is we have to quit just making it smaller. We have to keep talking about women's rights and, and access to uh, the, all of the opportunities that our society should provide to all of its people um, on that bigger platform. You, you, you have to have the ability to control your, your body. You have to have the ability to earn money. You have to have the ability to get an education so that you can uh, have a career. And those are all, uh, it, it all comes down to the, the simple phrase of simple justice in my, in my view. It's all about simple justice. It's all about understanding that women's rights are in fact human rights. And I think we should talk about all of them within that framework. It's, it's, I think we hurt ourselves and our cause when we make it smaller. And how do we talk about these issues with men? You know, there's, there's, we are very focused uh, at 5050 Day on the idea that men can be empowered by gender equality and gender parity as well to um, have, you know, more of a role in, in the lives of their communities and their families. And, and in research I've done about work, the number one regret that men tend to have is not spending enough time with people they love because they felt they had to always, you know, uh, be focused on career or be focused on, you know, just providing and not so much feeling and living. So how do we make this conversation something that really men relate to? Right. I think that's absolutely right. And, and it's hard for men because we all grow up in the same culture. We all we all in, ingest the same biases, both implicit and explicit. And so even though there's been tremendous social change and women have risen to, to roles that weren't even imagined possible, I mean, you and I would never have been talking about these issues 50 years ago. It just wouldn't have happened. So that's a pretty short time frame within, you know, within the long arm of history, as, as Martin Luther King would say. But, but you know, it's um, I, just to give you some examples for my own life, uh, my son has made career choices that enabled him to be more a part of his children's life than, than previous generations of men would do. And I've seen that happen in, in my very, you know, in my own family. 
my husband, who is kind of in many ways was raised somewhat traditionally and was, you know, he's a, he's always been a good breadwinner as it were, but I got to tell you, he was really glad that I was able to help uh, support the, the family unit. He, he was perfectly happy. And I think it relieves men of many of the stereotypes that have literally kept them in jail. Yeah. you know, in, in a sort of metaphorical jail. So it's good for men, it's good for families, it's good for children, and it's good for all of us. Yeah, obviously um, everyone has a different personal and family situation, but as you talk about your husband being supportive, I can't help but think of the late husband of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was notoriously supportive of her career, which was such a landmark in the legal yes. profession well before she got on the Supreme Court. So it, it seems to me that there is a synergy of interest. And, and he, you know, in talking about 50-50 day, we're not just talking about people who are gender binary. There are people who are non-binary gendered. It's about equality overall. But there's we're also living at a moment in time where some people are afraid that one person's equality will strip them of what they have. And so how do we respond to that? What we do at Take the Lead is literally redefine power. Mm -hmm. We literally deconstruct power and look at it in that old uh, constricted way of a finite pie in which you know people would think well if 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 you take a slice there's less for me and i won't be able to eat yeah. well the truth is we can bake more pies we can find new ways to bake pies the more there is the more there is there are no limits on on ingenuity on human ingenuity there are no limits on our ability to create new ideas there are no limits on love there are no limits on intelligence so we deconstruct the whole idea of power the old power over paradigm and translate that to a power to expansive paradigm i have the power to make life better for myself my family my kids, the world. I have the power to create, to innovate, to make possibilities happen. And all of a sudden, when I start working with women on that concept, and I think men too, I just see the masks fall off of faces. Mm -hmm. And you can get unafraid when you realize it's not a finite pie. And so just to, to wrap up uh, a final question, when you think about the work that you're doing now, and you think about your grandkids, you know, how do you keep that spirit going and, and also keep it intergenerational so that it's not just, you know, uh, adults talking, that kids understand that, that gender equality and getting to 50-50 is important. And also, you know, all of the questions of how we bring people together around this. How do you, you know, just maybe your grandkids uh, are an example of the conversation. Well, I, I, that's, that's, oh gosh, I wish I'd had time to think about that question because I think once we get done, I'm going to be writing a whole article on it. It's such a, such a great way of thinking about it. I, I, for, for my grant, well, here's what I, here's what I've learned over the years. The number one is that every generation has to speak in its own tongue. Yeah. And I don't care how much I can try to tell other people, I, you know, everybody has to speak in their own tongue from wherever they have entered the world. The world is different for each person because we all come into it from a different place. Um, but I think telling our stories is incredibly important. And I'm actually right now writing a family history cookbook. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and because, you know, we all eat together, we all eat, and it's a big, important part of the family culture. Oh, it's, so, it's certainly in my family. Yeah, so we that's, I'm right. At a Thanksgiving with 12 people and nine <laughs> desserts, if that would be that way. <laughs> We have the same family. <laughs> <laughs> and the green jello salad that nobody eats but everybody has to have on the table. Exactly. So, so I so I do think that telling our stories because all human beings learn through stories and you you can't do it pedantically. Telling our story is really important and not expecting not expecting people to um you know sometimes some things we just have to learn on our own. We have to make our own mistakes. So, again, I think being expansive and understanding there's no one one clear way and, but that, that being proactive and intentional about telling the stories. That's our responsibility, is to tell the stories. It's their responsibility what they do with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we have we have another moment to, to uh, converse. And I just want to know, you know, one thing that, um, that you have talked about that the 50-50 movie talks about is this idea that 
that there can be abundance, that, you know, as you said, we can bake more pies. But there's a lot of fatalism in this country right now, especially economic fatalism. And um, there have been a whole bunch of studies. There was recently one from PRRI, which studies politics and religion, just talking about people who feel like not just, not about gender in particular, but just in general, that their lives are getting smaller, harder, meaner. How do we as a nation, um, and this is obviously an international broadcast, but America can affect the lives of people around the world. How do we as a nation kind of gain a bit more spirit about addressing the challenges of our time? Isn't it ironic that in the richest nation in the world, we have the most malaise about those kinds of things? You go to other parts of the world where people have much less and you'll find much more optimism, uh, much less greed, much more openness to figuring out how to solve problems with fewer resources. So how does that happen? How does that happen? You know, the truth is ultimately, every one of us is the CEO of our own life. Yeah. We write our own story. We can't blame anybody else for what that story is. And so I think it does come down to leadership for a nation, leadership that actually teaches and, and expresses to the nation that we have opportunities, we have, we have enough, we have the ability to make more, we can be optimistic. We need to be optimistic. There are always problems. Leave, leave me. There are always problems. But that, in a sense, is what we're here to do, is to make the world better. We're here to repair the world, as they say. You know, it's, it's, it's almost, I see that as an opportunity. And I think it's all in how you interpret it. It really is in how we ourselves frame. Um, you know, I created these nine leadership power tools, and one of them is define your own terms. Mm -hmm. Define your own terms. We don't have to accept that there's this horrible, terrible world. We can decide, you know, this is a world of wonderful, beautiful things. And we can express that, and we can make it so. Well, Gloria Fell, thank you so much. It's, it's so great to talk to you and all of these leadership tools that you're talking about are part of your effort, take the lead. Um, and it, it, it sounds like you, know, you are moving ahead in making gender equality a powerful reality and not just a dream. So it's always Ooh. great to talk to you. We do our best. We try to put the legs on all of these great ideas. And to that end, I'd just love to invite anyone watching. We're having our monthly virtual happy hour this evening, and I'll get to turn the tables and interview Tiffany uh, for a few minutes. And also, I'll be interviewing some other folks who are among our at the top. And you can, it's free. Join us. We'll continue the conversation there. I am really looking forward to it. Thanks again, Gloria. Thank you, Farai. Bye-bye.